Hi, I'm Lisa and welcome to Oxwide. We've had a busy week and we've got lots to get through in this edition. So coming up in today's programme, we'll be meeting our team of cardiac rehabilitation specialists who spoke about life after a cardiac event needn't be completely daunting. When's the last time you checked your resus bag? Kerry and Nick are here to show you the hows and whys of regularly checking your kit. It could just save someone's life. And finally, we'll meet some of our professional nurse advocates and we'll be finding out more about the programme. So moving on to our first film. And for those who've suffered a cardiac event or are living with a heart condition, exercising can be a daunting thought. However, getting back to regular exercise is an essential part of the recovery process and our team of cardiac rehabilitation specialists have been working hard to support patients regain control of their health for more than a decade with both face-to-face -face and virtual classes. Earlier in the week, our very own Theresa May joined face-to-face -face sessions at Queen Mary's in Sidcup to find out more. The first person she spoke to is cardiac nurse specialist Sarah Hubble. I'm Sarah Hubble, I'm a cardiac nurse specialist working for the cardiac rehab team. So cardiac rehabilitation is a, um, a treatment option um, to help people to understand about their heart condition in order for them to learn about what steps they need to take to look after their health condition in the longer term. It basically empowers them to become involved in future health care discussions so that they can make a decision about their health care. Um, I joined the service back in last year, right in the middle of the first lockdown, and uh, which my, my colleagues stated it was quite a difficult time and a transition from face-to-face -face clinics and classes to a virtual class. Um, I'm quite new, so I had my interview, I think, uh, at the end of March, beginning of April. Um, I was fortunate enough to get the job, but I didn't start until uh, July. So when I arrived, uh, we were already up and running with the virtual classes. So I kind of hopped in with that. It was a new experience because even in university, we did the face-to-face -face, um, exercise classes. So it was, so it was quite new, but um, I had uh, two good colleagues that were able to support me. Plus I had the nursing staff as well, so that was good too. When we are all ready, we will then start with the warm up. So a nice little gentle march on spot. Okay, so when you're ready, start to assess the space you decided to do. Make sure you're not going to step on something or someone. You're going to take the arm and go backwards. Remember, we're making sure nothing's going above our head, so everything's shoulder height. You're concentrating. Yes, I can't breathe when you're internal monologue. So if you're saying yes, a little voice in your brain, I can't hear that. <laughs> I'm fine, Jay. Three. No, Sharon. I'm sorry, Sharon. Back to back, gentle march. Grab some water if you want to. <laughs> That's cheating otherwise, isn't it? It is really, yes. <laughs> Malik, are you okay? Give yourself a little bit of breathing rate. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's slow it down, we're just going to go to heel raises now. Place the hands together and pretend you're giving Calvin a big hug. And in about 20 seconds, we'll start with the leg stretches. Reset. All right, grab some water and grab a seat for me. Well done, everyone. Um, we will see anybody who has had an acute heart event, so they might have had a heart attack or heart surgery, might have had angina, had stents put in, for example, um, and they're referred to us from our local hospitals across the borough, so um, King's, uh, St Thomas's, as well as um, the local hospitals such as Queen Elizabeth Prue and Darren Valley. But we also see people with heart failure, which um, not many services see people with heart failure because of the number of staff needed to um, do the exercise with them. Um, the class was up and running when I came and uh, Helga was at the forefront with the nurses team. They showed me the ropes uh, because virtual class was quite daunting for somebody that hasn't done anything online beforehand. And it, it worked well, very well. Um, and it's still running to this, this day. Uh, so, but now we run uh, both virtual on um, virtual classes, we do 
one face to face home visits for the high high risk individuals and also we're now doing class environment too. With the virtual classes we can only accept really low risk patients, low risk in terms of uh, the likelihood of them having an event during exercise. With that, we need to ensure that they're stable on the medication, they're adhering to the medication. Uh, we've been through a functional test, so we know that functionally they are quite good and they're able to do the exercise itself. And then when they're exercising at home, they always have somebody there. So in case something were to happen, that, that they're there um, in the morning before we even start exercise, it's the case that we make sure that, that they are wearing appropriate footwear, they've taken the medications, because it's so early in the morning as well. And then through there, we're, we're able to go through. The important thing to say is that cardiac exercise is really, really safe. And I think a lot of people worry about doing exercise, especially after their heart event. The number of incidents with, with people taken on well during an exercise class is really low. And that's because we do a lot of risk assessments prior to them coming along to the class. The live classes, it's a, it's a bit more easier because we're able to uh, interact and you're able to see when patients are maybe beginning to kind of fall off a little bit. Um, so you're able to in, um, intervene quite quickly and either reduce the intensity at which they're exercising until their heart rate kind of recovers and they're feeling a bit better and then we can able to take them back up. Okay. So usually just before they refer to us they would have been on some kind of a walking program so, so, so they would have started to, um, to, to begin to get used to some form of exercise. When they come to us how we um, just like suppress their fears is just to sort of say that it's a slow build up so we start off nice and gentle with the warm-up itself and we take things through. And what this is, this is individualised to you as an individual. So it's not the group, it's not who you're exercising with, it's you. So we offer an um, education programme um, and that is mainly done at the moment via Microsoft Teams. It's a virtual programme. So one of our nurses and exercise specialists, along with other members of the multidisciplinary team, will um, do a short education session with them different session for about eight weeks. So we have the dietitian talking about eating healthily with living with a heart condition. We have our clinical psychologist talking about coping mechanisms, also managing stress um, and what tips they can do. We've got our cardiac exercise specialist who talk about long-term maintenance for exercise as well. With the variety of patients, we have to make sure that the information we give them is tailor-made for them. Um, so it's not a one-size-fits-all, um, especially when it comes to education. And that's why we do such a varied um, education kind of service. Um, so it's not just based around heart disease. It, it covers heart surgery, heart failure, helps younger people as well. So after they finish with our cardiac rehabilitation after the eight weeks, they have an option of joining the phase four in the community. That phase four is run by exercise specialists. If they don't feel a gym environments for them or the group environments for them, they will continue doing their home exercise programs, walking program, or if they've done a little bit of exercise at home with, um, with myself, Helga or Jay, then they can introduce that for themselves going forward. Physical activity is really important for heart patients. It does help prevent against future heart disease and helps strengthen the heart, especially when people have had heart surgery or they have heart failure. It helps to improve the heart muscle function. So we want them to be as physically active as they can. And when it's done with healthcare professionals like we have in our team of our exercise specialists, our cardiac nurses, we can do it safely and um, you know keep it safe for the patients. I do feel optimistic about the future. Um, it's been a de very difficult year for the cardiac rehabilitation team because we've had to change, but we, we have adapted and we have made, made great strides in doing virtual class and going forward, I feel it's a good team and we, we work together. So yes, I feel that uh, we will strive, especially now going back to face-to-face, -face, um, so we have a lot more to, to play with going forward. What a lovely film about the great work our cardiac rehab teams are doing at the moment in difficult circumstances. Like a lot of you across Oxleys, they've had to adapt very quickly their ways of working to provide a continued service to our patients who really need it and the help they receive can make such a big difference to their quality of life. A big thank you to everyone in the team and indeed all the patients who took part in this film, it's really appreciated. 
Anyway, next up, we have a short film about the importance of checking our resuscitation bags. We always hope these are never needed, but realistically, they do occasionally have to be used in emergency situations. In those high pressure moments, where time's of the essence, the last thing you want to find out is a piece of the equipment is faulty or has a ba flat battery. That's why it's so crucial to keep on checking. So over to Nick and Kerry to tell us more. Hello. Hello. So Nick, today we've got the resus bag. Yep. And I was just wondering if you could just go through it for me today and explain why the importance of it. Okay. So these red resus bags, they're emergency bags and they're kept on the wards of all our inpatient areas. Um, and they're designed to assist us with an unwell patient or a patient in cardiac arrest. There are checklists which are attached to the resus policy, uh, which can be found on the OX and they must be checked once a week. That's all the items here that are in the front pocket of the bag. And then once a month, the seal must be broken and all the items that are here have to be checked. Lovely. And can I just ask, while we're looking at the front pocket, mm -hmm. my defib, mm -hmm. how do I check my defib each week? OK, so the defib, what the important thing to remember with the defib is you mustn't keep switching it on and off because that just drains the battery and that's not how you test it. OK, the way that you test it is just visually. So in this box here, there are three symbols. There's a circle here. That tells us that the DFib has done its own self-testing. It's an internal program. It tests itself once every 24 hours, once a week and once a month. And as long as you've got a circle there, it's fine. If there is a semicircle or a cross, then there's a problem that it's found a problem with itself and you need to report that. This symbol here is the battery. So this is the same as the battery on your mobile phone. So if any of these symbols are not black, it means the battery is depleted. So you have to order a new battery. This symbol here is for the pads. This tells you that your pads are in date. If your pads are about to expire, this symbol will be half black and half gray. And that's picked up from information that's attached to a microchip in the connection here. OK, so I need a set of pads attached to my defib and mm -hmm. two spare sets, yeah? Yes, that's correct. Excellent. So in total, you've got three sets. Three sets ready to go. Mm. And in terms of the battery, do I need a backup spare battery or when do I order my battery? OK, so you only order the battery when the symbol tells you that you need to order it. So when one of these has gone grey, then you need to order that's a new what, battery. Point order. You don't need to have a spare in your bag because these have an original shelf life of five years, these batteries. So as long as you're not turning it on and off all the time, it will last five years. Excellent. And can I just ask, what is the importance of making sure that my expiry dates are OK on my, all of my items? OK, so I'll give you an example of a couple of items. These defib pads, for example, if these are out of date, there are two problems with that. Firstly, the stickiness goes from them, so they won't stick to the patient's chest. Secondly, there's a gel on them that conducts the electrical signal and the shock if you need to shock and that gel dries up. So that function won't be, you won't be able to use that function. So that uh, renders it useless. Okay. Another example if it is your cannulas. So if we were to put one of these cannulas in a patient, the needle comes out, obviously. The plastic bit stays in the vein. If this is expired, that plastic tube can degrade and then when you remove the cannula, it can leave little bits of plastic inside the vein, which can cause uh, necrosis in the patient's hand. Okie dokie. Sounds nasty. Um, can you please explain to me why we have a syringe with the bag valve and mask? Yeah, of course. So these bags, um, bag valve masks, they have um, a mask here that's got an inflatable cuff. Now, over time, because of the pressure that they're in, under, in the bag, these cuffs can deflate quite naturally. So if you were to take it out of the bag when you're checking it or in an emergency and you notice that this cuff is deflated, you just use this syringe, you attach it to this port here and you just reinflate some air into it. That gives you a nice seal on the patient's face. And we should be doing that at our checks? Your monthly checks. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. And on the um, checklist, it asks for a con the earliest consumable date and mm -hmm. it asks for the earliest drugs date. Can you just explain what they might be and where staff yeah, would find them? Absolutely. So the drugs that we're talking about on that checklist are these IV flushes and the bag of saline that's in this pocket here. 
they're the drugs that we're talking about not the drugs in your blue box or the date on your blue box it is the dates that are printed on these items here the consumables are everything else okay so just the earliest date of the first thing that's going to be expired. exactly lovely yeah. and can we just speak about the oxygen cylinders yeah. now we know that we have an oxygen cylinder in the bag mm -hmm. that we need to check yeah what is the importance of making sure that we've got cylinders outside of the bag as well the importance of that is that these cylinders they're quite small and if you are running them on 15 litres which is the highest setting which you would be when whether your patient was unwell or in cardiac arrest they're only going to last about 15 or 20 minutes so if you're waiting a long time for your ambulance potentially this could run dry and you need to have a spare to go over to okay and while we're talking about equipment outside of the, the, the bag mm. um, we need to think about our suction machine okay we have got uh, a video that, can sh that shows you how to check that suction machine. Lovely, should we watch that? Yeah. Okay, to test the suction machine, take it off charge, turn the dial around to 500 and press test. Wait for the second light to light up. Include the tube in, release the test button. Wait for the other lights to light up. When the top light lights up, release the tube in. The light will go back to the bottom and then press test and each light should light up again. That tells you that it's passed each of its internal tests. Plug it back in. So I come to my bag and do my check and I notice that I've got something that's missing or has expired. What can I do about that? Okay, so you can reorder it very simply by going onto Cardia and typing in resus template and then what you will get presented with are all the items that are here in front of us today. Um, there will also be order codes on there and there are also pictures on there so that you can double check that what you're ordering is correct. So I hope that's helped. Very helpful, thank you. Please don't forget to do your checks once a week and once a month. Make sure your bag is always ready to go in an emergency. I will. Thank you. Back to the studio. So a really important message there and thank you to Nick and Kerry and please we urge all of you who have a resus bag to check, check and check again. It really could be the difference between life and death for someone. Now earlier in the week I joined Associate Director of Nursing Christine Capopo and some professional nurse advocates. Some of you may not be aware of the Professional Nurse Advocate Programme. It was launched by Health Education England in March 2021 in response to the latest COVID-19 outbreak and here's what they had to say. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We've got Christine, Steve, Jamelia and Jane, and we're here to talk about professional nurse advocates today. So could we start with you, Christine? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right, OK. So I'm Christine Kapopo. I'm Associate Director of Nursing. Um, professional nurse advocate uh, training came out of um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the pandemic, we saw nurses at the front line coordinating and delivering care uh, to support those who were infected and affected by the coronavirus. Uh, it was clear from um, th that the world needed nurses to deliver uh, on the, on the uh, response and uh, also we saw that during the second peak of the pandemic, it was clear that many of our colleagues were experiencing stress and burnout. Some of it was resulting in mental health illness, such as anxiety and depression. And certainly there was exceptional pressure on many of our nurses and that um, the environments that they were working in were really, really challenging and they were made more complex by the pandemic. So as part of the recovery plan, the PNF programme was launched by Health Education England in March two, uh, 2021. And this was towards the end of the third uh, wave of the, the pandemic. The Professional Nurse Advocate programme delivers uh, training in restorative supervision and AQIP. Uh, AQIP uh, stands for Advocating for Quality Improvement. And basically, uh, colleagues are trained to deliver restorative supervision and support um, the improvement of uh, the quality of care they deliver to patients. The, the programme is the first in the world for nurses, and I am really, really proud that we've been able to support up to 15 nurses to um, undertake the programme. Thanks very much, Christine. Steve, if we could move to you. I know you're a mental health nurse. So can you tell us a little bit about what the course has meant to you and how you've applied it in the workplace and the difference it's made? 
Yeah, I mean, I I was approached by my ward manager in uh, March of this year whether I'd be interested in this PNO, and I have to be honest, I had absolutely no idea what it was. But it has a background. I mean, Christine's talked extensively about it, but the background comes out of the professional advocacy, which is was at the core program. Um, so I spoke to some friends of mine who are midwives, and the esteem in which they held the PMAs, um, you know, they saw this as a, a, a really useful tool, made me think, well, actually, I'd quite like to apply then. So, you know, I applied and, you know, the rest of the they say is history. And I, I literally finished it uh, a month ago, got my results last week as, you know, as, a, as a, an accomplished pass. So I'm feeling quite smug with that. But as far as application is concerned, it, it's difficult at the moment. Um, because I think, as, as Christine says, you know, this is the first that's out there. So I think as the first cohort, we were kind of going out to get the skills without knowing how we're going to utilize them. And that's not just unique to Oxleys. Everybody I spoke to on my cohort are all asking the same question. Well, how are we going to implement? So I've revisited, you know, my midwife friends and said, well, give me some insight. You know, there's no point reinventing the wheel. Let's see how you do it. The key fundamental about it for me it's about supporting your colleagues, whether they be management above, laterally or below. Also making sure that we have a quality implementation of care. And, you know, I've talked about this at length to a number of people about the more I talk, the more people listen, the more people they can tell about some of this skill set. I mean, I come from, I, mean, I came into nursing very late. I mean, I've only been a nurse for eight months. Um, you know, I spent 25 years in investment banking. Uh, running uh, a major investment bank in the city, and therefore quite a lot about leadership and management. But the PNA taught me more. I mean, you know, it actually honed it down more specifically to clinical practice, which is obviously much, much more key to us as nurses. Is knowing it's all very well having this hierarchical university ideas, but how do you actually make it work? Um, you know, and we have reflective practice where things will happen on the ward, particularly in mental health, and you know, you need to make the time to look at what's happened, but often from that, you don't really make recommendations or changes. Whereas the PNA role has that ability to look at it, look at the problems, look at it on a more lateral basis and think, well, this is how we can change it. This is how we can bring things in. But the key thing is, is to make staff feel they're part of the solution. Because at the moment with reflective practice, you often get, well, this is what happened. And management go off and discuss it and then throw a solution and say, right, let's do this. Whereas the PNA role is much more about, well, let's make you feel you're part of it. And let's really talk about it. You know, it's, it's a really interesting course. I absolutely enjoy doing it. Um, learns a great deal. Um, but would love to see how, how Oxley's want to implement it. Lovely. Thanks very much, Steve. I know, Jamie, you've joined us. You're from Children and Young People's Directorate. And you've, you're also a professional nurse advocate. Tell us a little bit about how you found the training um, so from my perspective, I think the training was actually very interesting. Um, initially, when I had applied for the role, it wasn't quite what I'd expected when I started the course. And I think that was common across everyone that was in, on the course as well. Um, is helping people talk through problems that they have and they come to the conclusion of how they can help resolve the problem that they have. So I, I think it's quite nice in terms of people being able to understand how they can then resolves the problem through the questions that we ask and um, which I think you get a lot more engagement and like what Steve said instead of people telling you what to do it's kind of like you've collectively come to that agreement. That sounds absolutely fascinating and a really great approach. Jane you're, um, you're a district nurse aren't you? I am yes. And you're also obviously now a professional nurse advocate so tell us about your experience and how that applies to district nursing. Okay, so I think as a manager in district nursing, and, and like Christine says, we've worked so hard through the pandemic that I'm very invested in my staff and ensuring that my staff's health and well-being is looked after as a manager. And I think this course has helped me improve my empathy skills, um, my compassionate skills when um, 
completing supervision or, or even just any communication with my staff in understanding how they're feeling, um, you know, what their workload is like, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, um, you know, assisting my staff to continue to give the best care that they possibly can to improve patient care has been the key for me in completing this course. That's that's lovely. Thanks, Jane. And it sounds like there's a raft of benefits to this. So so over to you, Christine, just for to wrap up. What would your sort of final word be? Yeah, so to sum up, we've got this um group of nurses that have gone up or gone out and done the training and have come back with the skill these skills and knowledge. Now the skills and knowledge will help us deliver our strategy, especially the third point in the strategy, which is making Oxford a great place to work. As Jane said, um the skills they have will help support the well-being and the feeling of inclusiveness of our nurses within the organisation. And hence, we can then deliver our, um, the making Oxford a great place to work, uh, which is part of our strategy. Going forward, we do have a meeting in September where we want your input, uh, whether you work in nursing or not, uh, therapies and other people want your input to help us think about how we can then implement this role within the organisation. I see it happening in two ways, implementing it within teams where people work or probably neighbouring teams so that there's that independence and that respect. Uh, sometime, um, and the other way we can implement the role is uh, having a trust-wide um, facility where people seeking restorative supervision can book into a meeting or with one of our PNAs and have that session with them. So discussions will happen in September and if you're interested in being part of that discussion, please email me and I'll invite you to the meeting. Thank you very much. That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> I want to leave. <laughs> Christine! <laughs> I'm sure Christine loved doing that really. A big thanks to her and all the professional nurse advocates and a reminder that if you want to find out more about this please drop Christine an email at the address on the screen now. So that's all we've got time for this week. We've really enjoyed getting out and about, meeting teams across Oxleys once again. And if you'd like us to come and speak to you and showcase what your team does, please drop us a line and we'll get something in the diary. Thank you to everyone who helped make this edition of Oxwide today. It's been a lot of fun. So until next time, goodbye. <laughs>